just a goof, but it's of the making of a goofy movie. The director of the movie, Kevin Lima, had tons of footage that I didn't even know existed. Um, I didn't know they were filming me when we did the movie. And there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that I found out about through seeing this documentary. And it's going to be out, I guess, on Disney Plus. They're talking with them right now. And uh, it's to be premiering pretty soon. So I hope everyone gets a chance to see it because I didn't know this stuff either. You know, I went through it from the outside in kind of. I went in to do my job and then, but I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. Well, just a little background here. My mom and his son, his name is Jack Skeeters, the special needs. And he took the doctors would say it's not a problem. Uh -huh. However, he can't say things. Yeah. He just does it. But he will say from the beginning to the next, <laughs> all the way to the end of the movie. He'll stand there and he leave him alone. And just watching from the doorway, he will say the entire movie from front to back. He knows every single word. It's literally his favorite movie. He's playing at least 20 times a week in my house. Oh my gosh. My only young residual is the I mean, we watch Disney movies, don't get me wrong, in the long run, but the reason we have Disney Plus for sure is all because of the internet. It's how to get on the tablet, on the phone, on the word. Oh, it's, exactly. it's amazing the way that that movie has uh, stood the test of time and is more popular now than it was. You know, in 1995 when it came out, we went up to Funko last year. They came out with a goofy movie board game. 29 years after the movie came out, um, that's unusual. And I've done about 3,000 different shows for Disney over the last 38 years. And uh, probably number one thing is what people talk about is the goofy movie. So it's had such an impact, uh, much more than I ever would have thought. And uh, like I say, this documentary is uh, kind of shows that they, they, it wasn't a big Disney release. It was kind of a B picture, really. And they, they did a, it was basically a Goop Troop movie from the series we did in the early 90s. Yes. And uh, there was a DuckTales movie after the DuckTales TV show. This is supposed to be a Goop Troop movie. But along the way, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was uh, the head of this project, wanted to make it a buddy buddy picture with Goofy and his son Max. So it became that. We even recorded some stuff for a Goop Troop movie, which was all scrapped after a little while. They kind of rewrote it and uh, I did it a little bit more and more. And uh, one thing that you'll find out in the documentary that uh, most people don't know about is uh, that, first of all, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was over this, wanted to use a celebrity to do Goofy's voice instead of me. And they were a slavery. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for box office uh, appeal, and they were thinking of Steve Martin, maybe. What? And uh, and that you no, know, and they said, "You mean Steve Martin would do Goofy's? No, you talk like Steve Martin. <laughs> well, it's not Goofy. Then. Well, that was a dumb idea. But they finally went back to me. They did that with Jim Cummings too. They wanted, to, they thought he sounded too cartoony, and so they wanted a regular actor to do him for a while. No, didn't work. Went around. So on that movie, I recorded off and on for over two years before it came out, and which is very unusual. A movie like that should be made in two or three days of recording and uh, some pickups and stuff like that. But our movie, and they came to me about a week in the recording. They said, okay. After they decided no, no Steve Martin, let them build it. Uh, I started recording. Then they came to me and they said, uh, well, Jeffrey thinks you sound too cartoony as Goofy, so he wants you to do it in your voice. You mean like I'm talking now? Yeah. No, the words every Max. But, uh, hi, howdy, Max. Yeah. And I had to go in and record for about a week in that voice. I was going home at night and they oh, my God, no. Don't, don't they want to hear Goofy if they're seeing a Goofy movie? Well, luckily, they agreed finally, and I got to re-record everything. That's why it was like 40 days of recording over about a two-year period to get that thing finally recorded. And uh, when it came out, before it came out, actually, we had a screening of it in Walt Disney's 
private screening room on the lot. And I'm sitting here, like Michael Eisner sitting here, Jeffrey sitting there, everybody. And my son was with me, and my family got to go. My son was about five at the time. And after the movie was over, and it wasn't even the full movie, the son was still what's called pencil tips, it wasn't colored in or anything yet. And they seemed they liked it and everything, but my son was crying a little bit. And I said, What's the matter? What are you doing the movie? And he said, Well, when you went over the waterfall, I thought that was you. Oh, oh. And so I knew it had a heart, and I knew oh, that was something that was touching. But uh, the tenderness and stuff that we, we gave to Goofy in that is stuff we never had to do before. Goof Troop, it was kind of Saturday morning, high energy. And uh, this, we had to make him a you know, father, you know, worried about his son and all of this kind of stuff, raising this kid. And so it was some levels of emotion we never had to do. And to get it to sound like it came from Goofy and not me, it was a little bit of a tough, tough thing to do it over and over. We did each line over many, many times to get it just right. But ultimately, they came around and uh, it became the movie that it is. So they, they were right. They just took a long way around the barn to get back to the door. And uh, once they did and got the movie out, it has never ceased to kind of slowly increase in popularity over the last 30 years. So. The more slides are all too full. All right, guys, well, I asked the question. We got some good information. They went to Wild Star. So, our microphones are working now. Hizzle, okay, Hizzle. Okay, we got a nice. Oh, yeah, I, I saw you earlier with the big doggy. Did you have a little bit of a little bit your question? I mean, go ahead. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, all right. So, all right. So, apparently, the last time we actually somehow saw saw Max basically part of the Disney franchise was only in was only in the second and was only in the second um, was only in Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas and and then well that's it. I mean, I mean the only I mean the only other time. Saying that well, we actually and saw saw him again was only was only in a picture in in the in the inductor in the inductor reboot where you where you were basically just showing just showing Donald like like a bunch of pictures of him that that, that, that mostly had snippets I think from from, from the Goofy movie. So do you think that somehow Dizzy Dizzy is somehow like phasing out the Max character and fully? in general, or or what? I don't know. They they had uh, the uh, if I understood the question right, are they phasing out the Max character over the years? They didn't use him in uh, several other shows, like you know Mickey uh, Mickey Mouse Funhouse, some of the, what what I call the traditional Goofy uh, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, um, those kind of things. It's just kind of the standard Goofy. And then we have like the the kind of the different drawing kind of goofy, which is what's called the Mickey Mouse shorts, and so that's more kind of 1930s goofy, more Dippy Dog than Goofy, even that. And uh, so they kind of have different planets they live on in a way. There's kind of like the Goofy movie universe, and then there's the Mickey Mouse shorts universe, and then there's kind of the standard Goofy. So every project we do, and I've done about 3,000 of them now over the last 37 years, um, every project kind of has a different vibe to it, you know, and a different kind of energy level. Uh, and so in some ways, yeah, they, they haven't used Max as much as they used to. They do have a walk around the Disneyland of Max, and uh, they, I think they, they have him out from time to time, but uh, not as much as they used to. And I wish they would because he's great. Jason Martin is still a great friend, and I see him from time to time. We do cons together, and uh, he's like a second son to me in email, which... Uh, this, you know, my son, when he was going through this, you know, people always ask what the, what it is like to have Goofy as your dad, you know? <laughs> and I think it screwed up my son for a little bit, you know? People would say, oh, are you Goofy's son? Is Max your brother? And he'd go, 
didn't think I had a brother. I don't know. So, but he's not all he would get. So he's a professional drummer and my engineer uh, occasionally when I do uh, my series work at home. And I started doing that during COVID, and we still do that from time to time. So I get my son some work to get to work with him. And uh, I was very proud just uh, about a couple of uh, last, actually last weekend, the D23 convention in Anaheim, they had a goofy movie panel talking about this documentary that's just coming out. And my son and I got to sing the open nod. We sang, and nobody else but you from the movie. And my real life son got to play the last part. That was very touching for me. It wasn't a dry eye in the house. It was a very kind of a neat thing and a big thrill for me to get a chance to do that. I hope that answers part of your question. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever jumped on this and agree with me. I think they should do another song with Max growing up as a girl dad, where he's going to have a little girl. And he's going to have a good going on trying to take the second trip. Oh, yeah. I don't think you've got them all. Tell me what I just don't think I've got them all. I don't know of anyone being developed except I've written some scripts, some ideas, and I'm talking with Disney about maybe. Hey, if no one else is going to do one, I think I ought to see what I can get out there. So I got some ideas like that. Yes, it's kind of like that. A uh, little bit of uh, Max and Roxanne are a little older. Maybe they're married. Maybe they have kids. Maybe Goofy's a grandpa now. Uh, we don't know. So there's a lot of ideas that we're playing around with. We need that. Yes, we do. Uh, uh, let Disney know. Yeah, get, get another Goofy. We need one. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, oh, we'll see this one. Go ahead. So, documentary about your life. Who's playing you? Who's playing me? Who's playing you? Oh, gosh. Steve Martin. Steve Martin. Who was Steve Martin? Steve Martin. Steve Martin. Yeah, because he almost got my job. So, that's yeah. good. And uh, yes, I get, I get, <laughs> I wish I was that good a comedian. He's fantastic. I like, uh, I like him. I, I actually worked with him once. So a long time ago, at the 50th anniversary of Disneyland, he did a, a program down there uh, at Disneyland Live. I got to uh, be around him a little bit. I didn't bug him too much because he's like going for lines and shit and everything. You don't want to mess with them before they go out on stage and, and do their thing. So some people get kind of, in themselves and kind of, you don't want to bug him, so I didn't bug him. He was there, so. <laughs> you have a um, yeah, so, you know, there was the, the DuckTales reboot in 2017 where the creators said they kind of wanted to do for Donald what the Goofy movie had done for Goofy and kind of reinforced that dad role. Um, and I was wondering, you know, with Goof Troop, and kind of like you said, um, what would you like to see or if yeah. you would like to see them do kind of with Goofy, if like, would you like to see them do almost like a Goof Troop reboot or something like that? Yeah, they do. They do a lot of reboots these days, and I think it's definitely after thirty years, it's about time to do a, a, another Goofy movie or Goof Troop kind of re, reboot. Um, I'd love to see all of that. It's so much fun to do this stuff. And every project is different, and. Uh, um, People talk to me all the time about doing uh, a reboot, and, uh, but it's not up to me. I have some of this kind of stuff. I sold, sold one series to Disney, and it was on for three years. It was called It's a Dog's Life, Bill Farmer. And I actually got to come up with that and sell that to Disney. Now, that's an interesting procedure in itself because a lot of people say, oh, I've been trying to sell a series to Disney for years, and I haven't even been able to get in and get a get a, uh, a meeting with them. We were able to, because of some friends that I have with Disney, get in and get a show, because the idea was that uh, I love dogs. I love live action dogs and dogs that have jobs and things like that. And we went in and thought that it'd be fun to kind of have one where I'm stepping out from behind the microphone because I've been doing animated dogs for 37 years. Now I'm finding out about real dogs with real jobs. And some things that you'd never know about uh, our canine friends and what they do. So we pitched this show and they bought it on the spot. I think it was one of the first shows that Disney Plus bought. We produced it in uh, 
We sold it in January of 2019. We didn't shoot a frame of footage until September of 2019 because that's lawyer time. That's when they're back and forth. Well, what they need is this, and the budget should be there, and all of those kind of behind the scenes stuff. Well, we got the got it all lined up, the stories and everything. And our first one that we uh, we didn't shoot it first, but we we it was first on the series was a dog that has the job of finding whale food. <laughs> now you might wonder, they have dogs that do that? Why do they have a dog that finds whale food? Well, the scientists that follow the orcas, the killer whales, uh, and study them, can't get close enough. They don't give a blood sample so you can see are they healthy, what are they eating, are they uh, reproducing, I mean, are they sick, are they well? So what they have to do is follow in a boat in the killer whales and find their poop. And they scoop it up and they can analyze it and then they can tell if they're healthy or not and everything. Kind of a weird thing to do, but it's kind of weird. Uh, be on the lookout for whale poop. Okay. And, uh, but they taught this dog named Eva, who is a uh, Jack, uh, Jack Russell pit bull mix. And to find whale poop, it will smell the whale poop and it will bark. <laughs> There's poop in the area. And then they look for it and they went from three samples to about over a hundred in the same amount of time. And they can study the, the, the uh, whales. We went up to near Vancouver where they had those killer whales were around and follow them for an afternoon. One thing that I can tell you that did not show up in the Disney version uh, of the show is that the mother killer whale was teaching the baby to hunt and eat seals. And during that, we found that I found out that they don't like the taste of the seal's lungs, and they spit them out like a sunflower seed. You know, there's a floating lung in the ocean. We scooped one up, and I got a picture. I followed it. Hey, here we go. Uh, the, the whales don't like the lungs. I don't know, I guess it's like, yeah, I'll take it. I don't like the liver either, so it's too bad. But anyway, the mother was teaching the baby how to hunt seals that afternoon. And in addition, it's just going down near Vancouver. And uh, we didn't show that to the So that's, that's just for you guys. But uh, we had so much fun. Uh, we finally started shooting that in September of 2019. In five months, we did 11 states, 20 shows, and we had all sorts of, we had uh, JoJo surfing Corgi, and his dog surfs, and he's got a website, and he's got all sorts of stuff. The mayor of the town of Rabbit Hash, Rabbit Hash Kentucky, is a dog. They elected a dog. And I asked a guy there, why did you elect the dog to be your mayor? He said, well, we'd love better than the guy we had. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, we had so much fun. We had uh, guard dogs. We had dogs that smell diseases in beehives. I found out that a bloodhound can maybe smell as little as one molecule and identify it of a scent. This dog would find other lost pets. And you can walk a dog through a dog park with all the other dogs coming and going. And if you let that dog smell a towel or something that this dog had been laying on, it'll get the scent and it can follow it through that park with all of those other hundreds of dogs for up to three weeks, they said. And, uh, and they, these dogs have found over 5,000 lost pets that way. Uh, it's amazing. Then in the Telluride, Colorado, they had the avalanche rescue dogs where they buried me in the snow and they teach the dogs how to find very skiers, you know, up in avalanche buried you. You don't have that much time to bring out the dogs to find you. And they can smell through 20 feet of snow to find you. And, and we had to uh, film that over and over because the dog found me in about, about a minute and a half. We didn't have enough time to film. So we had to do this over and over until we had enough film to put the show together. Uh, we've been doing it several times because he found me every time and uh, many other ones, but it was a, a great thrill, and that's my doggone life, is what I did. So. You had a question, brother? Um, when, when, did, when did you acquire the role, and what was your first job as you 
Okay, I learned the rule. The first job I did was January 23rd, 1987. And uh, my little background, I came from a little town in south central Kansas, Pratt, Kansas, west of Wichita, about 70 miles. I always loved movies, I loved cartoons, and uh, when I was a kid, I would start to impersonate things I heard on TV, usually live actors, but I would, I'd do my Nicky and oh, oh, oh. I'd, I'd like to do that. And, uh, and uh, in the old days, they had a lot of uh, guys. I think the first impression I did was Don Adams. Don Adams, I'll get smoked. If you remember that old TV show, one of my favorites was uh, Pat Buttram, who played in uh, Green Acres. I had a voice that sounded something like this. And uh, I'd do that in the movie stars, and, and uh, John Wayne with a lot of westerns in those days. And all the stories you do the John Wayne voice, and I did it sounded like that. In high school, uh, they put me up at uh, Pepperson because we would fight the Dodge City Demons, uh, Age Indians, uh, you know, crap, we were the crap fighting frogs. Terrible, <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> and so they put me out in front of the high school. I'm shy and everything, but I do those voices and, you know, let's go get the demons and, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, it kind of became a joke. And then my friends would, like, find out I would do voices and they would drive through things like uh, McDonald's and have me order a weird voice. Uh, like, uh, I like to have a really sucky soda. They look out. Oh, my God. 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 In radio stations, and I would do, uh, I'd create characters because I didn't care what I did. As long as I played the records, did the commercials, that's about all. And uh, I'd bring in a huge uh, Wolfman Jack. You remember him? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, 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 it's me. I'm radio. Hey, we're on this radio. Have you here today? I didn't know there were copyright laws or anything. <laughs> And uh, so I would uh, start doing that and inventing characters, and I started doing all of this. And uh, I was so shy, I didn't even tell my dad I used to do voices. And uh, I would do, I'd come to the table and I'd start doing voices for my parents. And uh, I'd do, uh, you know, a comedian George Burns was one I saw on Ed Sullivan all the time. George Burns, you sat for us in the I don't need voices. I told him to say, oh, I'd like to see my ass face. <laughs> and my dad looked at me, something weird about that kid. <laughs> but anyway, during, uh, after that, I moved to Dallas. And uh, in the early 80s, I started to go to a comedy club called the Comedy Club down there. And uh, the host of that particular comedy club, uh, first night I went up, was guy named Bill Kingball. You know, Bill, you know, yeah. he was from the Dallas Comedy Club that I started at. He was kind of the house comedy there, trying to learn his way through comedy. And, and he was the first one that said, you know, you know, the voices and stuff, you gotta, you gotta do that. You gotta give that a shot. And so I did. I started doing it more and more. Within six, eight months, I started doing some other clubs around. I even in Bossier City, I played Bossier City now, which is one of the stranger clubs I played at because. <laughs> There was a guy who was on stage, and the only time I was there, and it was a fight that broke out in the back of the club. These guys over the front tables is like an old saloon. <laughs> and I can hear fighting and glass breaking and stuff like that. I was in a wild club. <laughs> and I did that for a few years until uh, 1986, and an agent that I had said, Well, with all the wishes, you gotta go out to Hollywood and see what you can do. I got a place in Hollywood, and about five months later, an agent that I had said, do you do any of the Disney characters? At the time, there were four or five movies, Mickey Donald, stuff like that. Michael Eisner and Roy Disney wanted to hear the same one, because the, they were just getting on TV with the Disney Afternoon and the Disney Channel and all that. So they always wanted to hear the same movie, the same movie. And so I just got a cassette of Goofy from the old cartoons, practiced it over a weekend, laid it down, and about a month later they said they'd like to use you. And they did not sign you to a long-term contract. It's still, I'm an independent contractor. I'm not, 
I'm not a Disney employee, never have been. Uh, every job is a new contract. Every cartoon, the 3,000 things that I've done, everyone's a new contract. It is for all of us. Like that. And uh, so I did one, and it was a thing called uh, on January 23rd, 87, Disney's Doggone Valentine. And I went in and I had to reloop an old goofy cartoon, one line of dialogue. MTV's Disney's Doggone Valentine. They had, uh, it's kind of like a mashup of uh, MTV, basically. They had like songs over old clips of Disney things, and occasionally they had reloop something. And so I had to do one line of dialogue. And I did that, and uh, then uh, about a month later, they called me again, and again, and again. And about two years later, I got a series, Goop True. After that, Goopy Loopy, and now I've done there's several thousand projects for them, and they're still calling me in, but I'm still, everyone's a new contract. So when I do next week uh, cartoon shows, new contract. <laughs> I'm like a plumber, you know? It's like, you know, I go in and do my job, I go home. That's how it's <laughs> Yeah. Hey, uh, so, I was thinking about what you what you always say is that with voice acting, like it's important, like that you gotta be good at acting. Like it's not just about the silly voice. And it always gets me thinking about uh, when you were talking about how with Goofy movie, there were a lot more dramatic scenes in it, and, and then in something like Kingdom Hearts, it, where there's a lot more lore involved. There's Final Fantasy characters. Yeah, you're, you're yelling out crazy attacks, like like somebody come quick and stuff like that. And <laughs> are there other times where? When you're when you're doing the voice, you're thinking, "Oh my gosh, like how am I going to say this?" Like it, it, it doesn't even have to be like as goofy necessarily. It, it just, they're just been like weird. Um, I guess just weird recording sessions in general. Where like, okay, I, 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 I got to get through this. Like, I, I just got power through. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of times like that, and uh, Kingdom Hearts is unlike anything else we've done because it is the only one that was produced first in Japan, and then we loop it into English. So I'm listening in my headphones to the Japanese actors and the Japanese goofy who studied how I do the voice to learn how to do the laugh. It's kind of interesting to hear him laugh because the way I do it is a little mule. And uh, the way he does it, he broke it down into three parts to learn it. And it sounds more like, And it's very, it's odd. Goofy is one of the toughest ones to do in any other language besides English because he's what we call a cadence character. He's not, if you're doing Mickey, you know, if you do that falsetto, oh, gosh, oh, oh, you know, you're kind of in the ballpark anyway. And uh, Donald, if you can do that mouth thing, that's about all I can do is Donald. Uh, but Goofy is a cadence, it's gorgeous, it's ups and downs, and he's got a way of speaking, not necessarily the tone. And uh, the way he speaks and the modes is more important. Um, but do the thing now, we don't even have the other actors in the room. So I'm going in myself, and I have a script of lines that I'm going to do. Let's say I got 12 lines in this cartoon. And I'll go page one. I got the door. And the director, who's on a Zoom call, generally, we don't even get together anymore, or very rarely, um, if he's not available. And, uh, okay, give me three. Hey, man, what's along? Hey, man, what's outside? Hey, whatever the line is, you do it over and over. What's outside, man? What's outside, man? What's outside, man? Then they say, oh, maybe he's 50 feet away from me. <laughs> hey, what's outside, man? He says, oh, by the way, the room's on fire. <laughs> hey, let's get out of here. <laughs> gives you your idea of how to say the line. And so you got to listen to the director and because uh, I'm not hearing the other actors, and so I rely so much on the director to say, no, no, he's, uh, the room's on fire, so you got to say it with that kind of, that he's terrified. Or they'll give me the emotion quite often. But uh, a lot of times, just by reading the script, you get an idea of what it is. And I know the way that Brett is going to do a, a line with Mickey, and uh, so I pretty much have it in my head anyway. It's harder on the actor, but it's easier on the engineer because he can edit it together later on. Uh, 
So my question is, do you have a relationship that you have developed with Goofy, right? Do you think of Goofy in a way that you think of him as your friend or someone you know, or is it just going into the voice, you know, and you move on? And if that's the case, do you actually have that feeling? Blue is not around your voice, you know. And but I have been built to be lines like, okay, a slightly inquisitive bark. So you just try some, and oh, that one was pretty good. Well, you said, but yeah, you to do a good character, you've got to know the character, and that came true in the Goofy movie. Up to that time. I was kind of doing an impression of the original voice, Pinto Colby, who originated the voice. But after a while, you've got to kind of invest yourself in it, put yourself into the character. And I did that over a number of years and over that. And now I know Goofy better than I know my kid, you know. So, <laughs> um, so I know the way that he would say something. So after a Goofy movie, really, it became um, much easier for me to just say anything and it would sound like Goofy did. Um, point out, very early I had to do a thing at Disneyland where they were having a state fair thing and I had to do the spiel for the monorail. Now that wasn't written for Goofy and that was really tough in the beginning because I didn't know Goofy well enough to know the way he would say something to make it sound like it was really from Goofy. But, um, Later on, as I learned the character more and invested and discovered what the character is, and sometimes defined what the character is, then it became much easier. And it just became like a second nature. So, like, I put Bill over here on the shelf when I do Goofy, and I become Goofy just for that instant, for that line. And over here, you practice it enough, you, you do it, you know. So, thousands of lines that I've done, dialogue and everything. Yeah, I'm kind of the. Uh, I've got it down now. I think I got it down. <laughs> so, with, the, with all Disney stuff being bound in copyright, are there pretty restrictions about what you can and can't say in the character voices? Yeah, I mean, you treat the character with respect you would, you know, I'm not going to say a bunch of cuss words or something like that, because no, that's not goofy. First of all, and I try to stay true to the character as much as possible. And yeah, they're really protective of the character. Um, it's kind of weird. It's like I kind of own Goofy and Disney kind of owns Goofy. Because, you know, if I own my own voice, it's weird. You know? And there's a bunch of stuff going on with the unions now about AI and uh, can they reproduce my voice? If it's close to mine, because I do own my image, do I own my voice or my interpretation of this? It gets really sticky and it's going through a lot of a lot of stuff in the unions now. And I hope that uh, they have good things because it's hard enough to be a voice actor. Um, when I did Goofy audition, even back then, I, I had there was eleven hundred other people that tried out. So the odds aren't very good in any case. Now there's probably a quarter of a million people in the Screen Actors Guild in LA. Not any given week, there's maybe 10, 15,000 jobs. So let's say 10,000 out of 250,000. That's not a big. There's a lot of out of work actors. Is what I'm saying. You know? So it's very competitive on every job that. I do when I did Hop Hop on uh, Amphibian. There were probably about a thousand or a couple of thousand people trying out for that. And now with the internet and everything, a guy in New York can try out, a guy in Chicago, across the country they'll try out. And so they've got to whittle that down to the people that they, they want to use. That's why there are, uh, it's tough for you know, uh, one person to get a whole lot of roles and that's just you build a relationship with the, the people there, and they know you can do it, and they don't look bad by bringing in, well, the guy you brought in really sucks, so we're in trouble here. So they, you get a reputation, you get known for what you can do, and that you're a good person to invest in, to bring in, to, that they won't screw things up, you know? <laughs> it's, it's quite competitive, and yeah, Hollywood's a lot tougher than, if I'd known this, I probably wouldn't have gone to Hollywood. 
And ignorance was bliss in my case. So yeah. <laughs> it was really, it's tough. It's tough for anyone wanting to do it. And I'll, people always ask me, what do you need to do to be uh, a voice actor? I say, first of all, get rich parents. Uh, You're going to need it for the first couple of years. All right, we're going to ask Kathy. We're going to make you the last question. Uh, but I want to put something out there because he mentioned it. Gay um, Save. We have had the privilege over close to a decade now to meet tons of actors, voice actors and actresses and artists from all walks. And one thing that is a problem that is going to affect every single one of them here in the near future is AI. Yep. And I need you to really think about this because he meant a lot to us, he still does. We're gonna lose guys like that when they start letting AI do the voices in these shows. There are already big name comic companies, you can Google this, okay, that are already putting AI covers on their comic books that is taking a job away from an up-and-coming artist that's never even gonna get the opportunity to be on the book that they wanna be on because they're letting the computer do it. AI is them, there is no way around it. I hope that all of you guys will keep that in your in your hearts and your minds going forward because everything that we care about as far as entertainment is about to be affected and they are about to start using it at every opportunity that they can. So y'all just keep that in mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a potential, a real problem. My son's a professional drummer. And they've had drum tracks for years and he'll use those and he thinks that he doesn't think it's going to replace drummers because no one wants to go see a concert and some laptop is up on the stage. You know, right. they want to see that personal, the artistry that comes from it. And that's what's important for voice actors, on camera actors. I mean, everyone can be replaced by AI if it gets sophisticated enough. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's got to be if we want to have any jobs at all. Uh, you gotta, gotta limit that and regulate it quite well. So that at least you've gotta sign off on it. And oh, it's okay that AI does this or that or how it's used, but just on this program, not on other programs. And there's a bunch of things that are working out now. Hopefully they do because uh, yeah, it hurts everybody if they, AI is going to be a common thing. And you know, I guess on any job, eventually it could be up for grabs. I mean, you know, welders, you know, they got automated welders and car factories now. That's well, machines that's, taking over. That's my uh, that's my uh, track. That's what I've been on. Really? So, oh, well, then you know. We yeah. haven't had those machines that can weld, but it's, we're a long ways away from having one that can get up in a pipe rack down the hole. That's like, true. That's true. true. But yeah, there are, there are some bad jobs yeah. out there that have the. Push your foot down on the foot pedal and the thing comes down, starts the wheel, and makes the wheel. And now you got to do the same thing watching on the computer screen. Yeah. I mean, there still has to be a person to. to yeah. Do. Well, that's good. That's good. And hope it stays that way. You know. All yeah. right. But the last question. Speaking of hot pop, man, maybe I, uh, how was it to, to work with the other cast members in the show? That was, that was a lot of fun, but again, uh, I did like the whole third season during COVID from my hot house. So I wasn't in the studio with them. I know them, I've met them at cons and, uh, and uh, at events and stuff where we'd get together, but uh, we didn't work together, not even for the whole series, not, not one time. Uh, even before COVID, when we were doing like seasons one and two, uh, we met everybody, but we didn't work together because I was working from a studio at one time, then they bring in someone else. When I started, in 1987, we, uh, my first series go through, we did have everybody in the room at a microphone. It was like a radio play, but we were recording on 24 track audio tape, not computers. And so but now with computers, it's much easier. Oh, Bill can come in on Tuesday and record these lines and, and Brett can come in and record Mickey on Wednesday and then we'll just marry them together in editing. And it's no big deal, and it's easier on both of our schedules. Whereas in uh, Goop Troop, everyone had to be there at Tuesday, two o'clock. And that's can be a lot. Well, I gotta go to a doctor, so well, I'll change it, or we'll have to change everybody. Uh, it's much easier technically to do that, but it's not much fun. 
And so, but it's, I, I love, I love hearing it. A lot of times, if someone else goes first, they'll use their playback and you can play it in sad. So if I heard Ann say something, and, and I did my, my voice of the pop pop, I said, say what? Or whatever I said in the episode in response to what I hear, but I don't see them. They are in the building. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Hey, everybody stand up. Let's get a round of applause. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.